Sometimes you hear that goodwill is something that comes naturally to all of us. And goodwill for some beings does come easily. But for other beings it's hard. And yet the type of goodwill the Buddha wants us to develop is exactly that, something that has to be developed. There are a lot of beings out there that are hard to like, easy to have ill will for, easy to resent. And you have to have goodwill for them too. Otherwise, it's like building a fence around your house and then leaving a huge hole here and there so anybody can come through. The fence gets pretty meaningless after a while. Because the Buddha does present goodwill as a protection and as a form of restraint. The image that comes to mind for most people is a heart overflowing with goodness without any boundaries. The idea of restraint sounds more restrictive. But there are qualities in the mind that have to be restrained if you want your goodwill to be universal. Like the desire to see somebody suffer. And it's easy to dress that desire up as a desire for justice. Someone's misbehaved and it doesn't seem right that they don't get punished for it. You have to stop and think. How many times do people get punished and actually improve themselves. Now, this doesn't mean we just let people do what they want. But when you hold people back from bad behavior, it can't be done with ill will. The same with people who are happier than you are, who are better off than you are. It's easy to resent them. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha parses out goodwill in the Sublime Attitudes into three. There's generic goodwill. May all beings be happy. Then there's goodwill specifically for people who are suffering, and that's compassion. May those who are suffering be released from their suffering. And then there's goodwill for people who are already happy. Those who are happy, may they continue in their happiness. It's very easy to feel resentful for them, but it's a test of your goodwill. You say, may all beings be happy, be happy, and then you come across someone who's happy and you resent it. There's a conflict there. There's an inconsistency there. There's a small-heartedness there that we have to overcome. After all, other people's well-being does not reduce our well-being. And we're not here to compete. And when you get happy, you want other people to be happy for you, right? You might be happy for them. But sometimes you see people who are well off and they're abusing their power, they're abusing their beauty, they're abusing their, their wealth. And those are the people you have to have compassion for. You don't say, well, may, may their beauty and power and wealth be taken away from them. The correct hope is, may they learn how not to be intoxicated by those things. And that develops a certain maturity. And that's what the sublime attitudes are all about, is being mature in your emotions, being mature in your attitudes towards other people. Because when you develop the attitude, may all beings be happy, and you try to do it in an all-around wise and circumspect way, it's going to teach you lessons about what it means to be happy and also what it means to develop an attitude. The happiness we wish for others is a happiness that's reliable, a happiness that's solid. A happiness is based on skillful behavior. Which means that if there are people out there you don't like, you can still have goodwill for them. If their behavior has been unskillful, 
you wish is that maybe they maybe they become more skillful in their behavior. As for developing attitudes, remember what the Buddha said about fabrication. You, you shape your present moment experience, your present activities. And the two go together, the experience and the activities. These are things that you do. You breathe in a way that shapes your experience. You talk to yourself and that it shapes your experience. And you think of various perceptions, images that you hold in mind. And so if you have trouble extending thoughts of goodwill or compassion or empathetic joy to somebody, ask yourself, could you talk to yourself in a different way? In other words, can you choose a different thing to focus on about that person? And you can tell yourself other things that are true. We're not engaging in make-believe here. Why would it be good to develop thoughts of goodwill? It's for your own good, it's for their good. And then what perceptions do you hold in mind? A lot of these perceptions will be related to your worldview. If someone's been misbehaving and you're being affected by their misbehavior, remind yourself that you, you don't remember your own misbehavior from previous lifetimes, but it's probably been there. So when someone is behaving in an outrageous way, maybe you behaved in an outrageous way in the past. That reflection helps put things into perspective. That perception helps change the game, Change, changes the score. So if you're having trouble extending thoughts of goodwill or compassion or empathetic joy, think about how are you talking to yourself, what perceptions are you holding in mind, and how you can change that. Because it is for your own good to become skillful in goodwill. As for equanimity, that's the reality check. You notice as passages we have, we start up, may all beings be happy, and may those who are suffering no longer suffer, may those who are having good fortune continue in their good fortune. It's may, may, may. Then we get to equanimity. There's no may there at all. All beings are the owners of their actions. A while back I was in France teaching in a group, and they had their versions of, versions of the chants, and the version of the chant for the good sublime attitudes was May all the way through. Equanimity was May all beings be the owners of their actions, May whatever they do for good or people, to that will, that, to that will they fall heir. It sounds like a curse. Equanimity is actually a statement of facts. There are going to be limitations on what you can do, how far your goodwill can have an impact. You have to accept that sometimes. Otherwise, if you can't accept it, then you're going to be butting your head against the wall, wasting your energy that could be put to better use elsewhere, to realize that there are limitations. Some people are beyond help. And a lot of discernment goes into figuring out when you have to give up. Even the Buddha would give up on some people. You know, there's that famous analogy he had about horses. Some horses are trained gently, some horses require harsh treatment, some require gentle and harsh treatment. And if they don't respond to any of those kinds of training, the horse trainer shoots them to maintain his reputation as a good trainer. And the Buddha said in the same way. There are those he had to train using harshness, those he trained using gentleness, those he trained using both gentleness and harshness. Then there were those he killed. The horse trainer said, how can you kill anybody? You're a Buddha. The Buddha said, well, just don't teach them. That's the same as killing them. So even the Buddha found that there are limitations. After all, he was the teacher of those fit to be tamed. He's not the teacher of everybody. 
there are those who would not respond to his teaching. They resisted, resisted, and he just didn't bother with them. Several cases in the canon where people would come to argue with him, and he refused to engage in the argument, because he said, so I wouldn't accomplish anything. So even he had his limitations, to say nothing of us. But that doesn't mean we stop having goodwill. It just means that we have to have a realistic attitude toward it, what it can do, what it can't do. And the main emphasis is always, what is it doing for you? It protects you from unskillful thoughts, words, and deeds. That's how it's a form of restraint. It holds you back from doing things that are going to be unskillful. So you need goodwill. Sometimes they try to justify goodwill by saying, well, it's because we're all one, or we're all interconnected. That we should have goodwill for one another. But the Buddha never said that. He said, it's your protection, it's your guardian. It goes with a sense of shame and compunction, that you'd be ashamed to afflict anybody with, with harshness that was just for the sake of afflicting them. And you realize that there are also the consequences that would come. acting on ill will. So whether you like people or not, whether your happiness is greater than theirs or their happiness is greater than yours, whether they're abusing their happiness or not, you've got to have goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy for your own safety. When you can think in these ways, that's when your relationships with other people become more mature. Otherwise, we're just little children acting out with our emotions. And that's not good for anybody.